minds throwing out their own rotten apple, but they... Well, we do hate being told that our barrel stinks. So I... Um... <laughs> anyway, what about lunch, hmm? Philip, the barrel stinks to high heaven. But having done that, you then felt happy to go and make the night porter. I didn't feel happy, but I thought, well, now in for a penny, in for a pound, and uh, it went straight on into the night porter, so I, 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 I felt, all right, I can do it a bit, you know. I don't like it, but I can do it. Can, can you tell me something about the night porter? I'd really rather not, insofar as... Uh, I'm not evading anything, but it, it's such a terribly complex story. It's a love story. But it's a very complex story, and also I <laughs> confess that I've written most of it myself with Cavani, because we took a lot of stuff out and we condensed a lot of stuff. So I don't honestly know what the hell the thing's about, I except that it's a very strange, very odd, I think desperately moving, uh, very passionate, very, very passionate love story between two middle-aged people. Now, that sounds awful. Charlotte Rampling is not middle-aged, but she's playing a woman of mm. 35, and I play my own age, which is 53. Um, but it just goes to show that love does exist and can exist in that age group as well as it does with, with people of a much younger group. In fact, it's more passionate at that time. Do you still regard yourself as being semi-retired then? I am semi-retired. You work in the winter months? Uh, if I have to. I mean, it's, it's easier to work in the winter months because it's difficult here because I, I can't do anything here until February when the olives fall and I've got to do all my olive picking. Uh, October's wet and very dark and cold. November's miserable here anyway. Cause we, and then we get the snow in December on the mountain there. Um, so it's better to go away and work. And I will also then I can, you know, put another bit onto the house or build another loo or something like that. But I really have retired. But you're in the I mean, I don't, I don't want to work again, ever. Is it because you don't enjoy filmmaking? Don't, I don't like it anymore. I, I think I, uh, lying on the floor the other day in the studio in Ginny Star with Charlotte Rampling sitting on top of me, my fly buttons open. And all the crew were, I thought, what on earth am I doing? I'm 53, why am I going through this at 53? When I was England's number one, you know, no, pretty face. <laughs> it's madness. And I have to get up at half past five in the morning and stagger down with great baggy eyes. It's not on. I don't enjoy it anymore, truly and seriously. And the joy is gone, the magic is gone. Mm. I think possibly, truthfully and seriously speaking, I'm better now than I ever was, like wine ages in an old bottle. Uh, probably, at my, probably at my peak now. Yes, I would have thought so. But I don't like it. But if Simple Visconti stuff. came along with another script as good as Death in, in Venice, would you... Uh... Look here, if Visconti came along with Sears and Roebuck's catalogue, I'd do it. Emotionally, of course, I should miss the cinema very much. Um, but I'm never out of touch with it. I mean, the horrid things like the Cannes Festival happen, you know, and people come up and you see it and you keep in touch. I go to the pictures in Cannes on a wet Sunday. I keep in touch with it, but I, I'm not anxious to work in it again. If something, as I reiterate, if something magical happens, okay, but, you know, really forget it. It's not a grown-up man's job anymore. <clears throat> the adventures of uh, Barry Mackenzie is arguably the type of cinematic statement which committed Australian cineasts to repudiate. Uh, hopefully, indeed, uh, arguably, it is uh, crypto-fascist, uh, pseudo-simplistic, and uh, it fundamentally lacks relevance uh, subtext-wise. There's a cultural renaissance going on in Australia at the present period of time, hopefully where there's no place for Humphreys and his commercially oriented cronies with their superficial lifestyle. I think I've got a pretty well-developed sense of humour, but when I saw the box office receipts of The Adventures of Barry McKenzie, frankly, I didn't laugh. 
arguably speaking, hopefully, Barry Humphreys and his officiados have got a lot in common with the old Rudolph Valentino flicks. They're both a sad case of radical chic. Right, okay? Right, okay? Good evening. That was Craig Jellis, the well-known Australian critic and nose picker, with some controversial views on the new film, The Adventures of Barry Mackenzie. Mackenzie's a kind of Australian Candide, the hero of a strip cartoon in Private Eye, and a modern cult figure. Jerry Cornelius is also a modern cult figure, and so too, though he dates from a rather earlier age, is Philip Marlowe. And both of them are also immortalised, or in Marlowe's case, re-immortalised, in films that are to be released shortly. We'll be seeing something of all three movies, though not, arguably and hopefully, of Craig Jellis later on. And I'll be talking to one of the stars of Barry McKenzie, a lady indeed who lays claim to the status of superstar. But before we examine that preposterous claim, I'd like to have a quick look at some other cult figures in the cinema. Well, I say in the cinema, but in fact, apart from comedians like Chaplin, Keaton and Laurel and Hardy, the movies rarely create their own cult figures. Mostly it's quicker and easier to borrow them from literature. Sherlock Holmes, for instance, the Saints, that dreadful fascist bulldog Drummond, and the most successful of them all, James Bond. Bond is perhaps the one instance in which the cinema version improves upon the original, because the films play down the more distasteful aspects of the character, his snobbishness and his xenophobia, and provide him with a sense of humour, which is more than Ian Fleming ever did. Sean Connery was the first screen Bond, and a sort of cult figure himself. But now that he no longer plays the role, United Artists have laid him to rest. Sean who, they say? No, no, there's only one James Bond, and that's Roger Moore, who, of course, just happens to be the latest. So instead of Sean Who, here's beautiful Roger Moore dusting up a villain in Live and Let Die. I suppose it was inevitable that having cannibalised practically every other form of literature, the cinema should finally turn its beady eye onto the strip cartoon. Roger Vadim helped set the trend in the late 60s when he filmed Barbarella, a space epic set in the year 40,000 AD and based on a kinky French comic strip. It was described at the time, by its publicity people naturally, as a real breakthrough into sexual fantasy. And I have to admit that the sight of Jane Fonda wandering about in what looked like a white bathing suit and high leather boots was a real breakthrough into sexual fantasy all by itself. But alas, it didn't really work. And although Miss Fonda lost all her clothes on a number of occasions, there was only one Barbarella movie. Here now is Miss Fonda. in time my energy box is completely dead are we all right now i think so excuse me uh -huh. philip marlowe is one cult figure that the movie industry simply cannot leave alone and i can well understand the attraction marlowe's creator raymond chandler is not just the man who raised the detective story to an art form he's also one of the finest american novelists of this century and marlowe is the epitome of the tough but sensitive poor but honest cynical but incorruptible private eye. At one time or another, and with varying degrees of success, he's been portrayed by Humphrey Bogart in The Big Sleep and Dick Powell, seen here playing it cool and laconic in Farewell, My Lovely. The oftener you go over it, the sillier it sounds. 
You don't know anything about Marriott. You don't know how much money you were carrying. You don't know what it was supposed to buy. Trusting soul, wasn't he, letting you carry the pail? Sorry, I don't have it now. Right after I beat Marriott's brains out, and just before I hit myself in the back of the head, I hid the money under a bush. Uh... Supposing a jewel outfit got the bright idea of using a detective as a utility man for contacts and payoffs. Suppose they ran out of uses for him. They might try to hang a murder around his neck, wouldn't they? Oh, great. Now I'm a figure for a heist mob. Also, I'm Jack the Ripper. Look, I try to be helpful. I get up off the nice cold ground and walk five miles to a phone right after having my head treated. I lead you to the body instead of letting you find it next Christmas. I tell you all I know four times. It sounds screwy. All right, it is screwy. Sometimes I'm not smart, but it's all I know. Now, I'm tired of looking at you and listening to your bum guesses. Either book me or let me go home and go to bed. As long as you're going to get personal, I don't like looking at you either. I don't like sitting here. I'd much rather be home in bed, too. The latest Philip Marlowe, soon to be seen in Robert Altman's version of The Long Goodbye, is Elliot Gould. I'll have more to say about this when the film is released in a few weeks' time. But for the moment, I think I'd better reveal a personal prejudice. Philip Marlowe is my own particular cult figure, and therefore I've never been happy with any of the people who've portrayed him on screen. The fact is, and I really don't understand how filmmakers can be so thick that they don't realise it, there's only one person in the world who's exactly like Philip Marlowe, and that's me. Still, until this obvious point sinks in, I suppose we'll just have to put up with inferior substitutes like Elliot Gould, seen here being bullied by the cops. Uh, Miami. Right. Uh, How about Washington? Washington. Oh, no, Washington. Girls, did you see my cat? I didn't even know you had a cat, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, you, you, you wanted a hat. No, no, you don't look fat. Mr. Marlowe. Your name, Marlowe? No, my name is Sidney uh, Jenkins. Come on, let's go inside, Here, Marlowe. We want to talk to you. Oh, well, I'm looking for my cat. You Forget know, the goddamn cat, Marlowe. Come on. Forget the goddamn cat. Right, I see. Okay. Now, that cat means an awful lot to me. He's telling me to forget about it. Must be something mighty important. <laughs> Sit down, Marlowe. No, it's okay. I'd rather stand. No, I don't mind sitting either. Marlowe, I'm Sergeant Green. This is Detective Dayton. Yeah, yeah, I saw your badge. Where's his? Uh, where did you go last night, Marlowe? Oh, is this where I'm supposed to say, what is all this about? And he says, uh, shut up, I asked the questions. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Marlowe. Right, so just ask the questions. Where did you go last night? Well, maybe if I knew why you wanted to know, I could remember. You gainfully employed, Marlowe? I don't know. <laughs> where do you work? Yeah, yeah, I heard you. I understand English, believe it or not. I'm a private detective. I have my own agency. Those girls are vicious. Actually, I'll take a better picture now, but your business hasn't been as good as it used to be. I'm sure you guys understand. A few months ago, there appeared, and then for some inexplicable reason disappeared, a delightful British thriller called Gumshoe, which starred Albert Finney, and was a subtle and affectionate parody of Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and the tougher movies of Humphrey Bogart. It was written, and very well written too, by Neville Smith, who on behalf of Film 73 has been looking into the making of the final programme, a film devoted to the adventures of Jerry Cornelius, a space-age cult figure who comes to the cinema by way of books and a strip cartoon in the International Times. Here, then, is Neville Smith's report. The final programme is, author Michael Moorcock tells us, not strictly science fiction. It is, he says, set in an alternative view of the present. Nevertheless, it has many elements of science fiction in it. After the funeral of his father, a famous scientist in Lapland, our hero, Jerry Cornelius, is apprised by a sage of the imminent collapse of world civilization. Unfazed by this news, Jerry hot-foots it to his ancestral home to give his brother Frank a taste of what's to come with the aid of some napalm. Frank, you see, has been slapping their kid sister about, mostly with drugs. Meanwhile, Miss Brunner, a lady scientist and three fellow boffins, plan to use Dimitri, a handsome Greek guinea pig, to create a new messiah. In order for this plan to be perfected, they need a missing formula, which is on microfilm and may be secreted at the Cornelius home. In between times, however, Miss Brunner achieves the big O by eating people. The questions are, will Jerry napalm Frank and rescue his sister? Will Miss Brunner find the missing microfilm and will Jerry help her to do so? Will Dimitri be given the old heave-ho in favour of Jerry? Jerry, you see, has got a lot going for him, his needle gun, his American sedan, his looks, his chocolate biscuit and his whiskey. And will all be resolved before the world goes down for the count. Earlier this year, I went down to the set of the final programme to talk to the principals involved in the film which is directed, written and designed by Robert Fust, whose credits include the Dr. Fibes films. I started by asking actor John Finch about the part he plays in the film. 
Well, the character's name is um, Jerry Cornelius. He was originally created, I think, somewhere in the early 60s as um, an embodiment of uh, uh, freedom and, um, and fantasy. He's, uh, he was at one time, I don't, I don't think he still is, but he was at one time a, a sort of a hero in International Times, sort of underground cartoon uh, strip, you know. And um, he is in, I mean, he is everything. This is the, the whole point about the character. There's nothing logical about him, in a way. He's, um, he is known as the English assassin. You know what? I'm thinking of getting rid of the house. Getting rid? Yep. Blow it all up, I fancy. When? Well, the day after tomorrow, if I can get back in time. But what about your brother, Frank? I understand he never leaves the place. Yeah, that's why the idea appeals to me so much. And your sister, Catherine? What about her? Well, now that father's dead. Hmm. I think the fact that making this film after Dr. Fives is, uh, to me, very attractive because this has got certain elements that Fives had in as much as although Fives was set in the 30s, that had a kind of surrealistic uh, atmosphere. And I think, I like to think, anyway, that we've managed to uh, grab hold of what was the best in Fives, update it, and suddenly introduce a surrealistic atmosphere into present-day situation. Are you writing me, man? Not tonight, baby. Out of shades. Mr. Jerry Cornelia is a legend in his own lifetime. Ta-da. How's the assassination business? Still up there at number one. Two presidents and one queen. How's that for a count last? Get away. What about napalm? Napalm. Huh. Are you buying or selling? Asking. Who wants it, you? Uh -huh. Give me a couple of days. Too long. Oh, shit, Jerry, come on. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is Sunday. So, all the shops are shut. Shit. Well, I play the part of Miss Brunner, and um, she's a lady scientist, and she has um, plans, um, albeit rather uh, eccentric, in order to, to take over the world and to save it by creating a new messiah. I'm sure, gentlemen, whether we should include this Mr. Cornelius at all. Surely we have no alternative. No? What's to stop us going now? He's not expecting anything. He could be useful, but he's not essential. As far as we know, he could be planning some kind of double-cross already. I stand to lose too much. Miss Brunner, we all stand to lose too Quite much. Quite right, yes. Dr. Pouse. I'm sure when you meet him, he'll pass even the Brunner death. If I meet him. He's a random factor. Involving someone else at this late stage could jeopardize our work badly. With respect, Miss Brunner, and I would like to point out... And if he doesn't come, do you propose to abandon the whole idea? Mm, of course not. Abort the final program. Unthinkable. What? You know better, Miss Brunner. Well, I think it, it, it's comparable, in a sense, to a kind of Alice in Wonderland situation, where you get a particular kind of situation where a person is walking through situations which are larger or smaller than life, and at first glance, they may seem to be incredibly over-exaggerated and extraordinary. And yet, when you really think about it, they are happening now. And there's all this, which is... That's got to be good, isn't it? Got to be good, isn't yeah. it? And he stands here, and there's mist here, and he fires a very pistol. <laughs> and it bursts. Mm. Up there. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. And over there is old John. <laughs> Uh, goes without saying, sir. I'm very sorry I was to hear. Always very good to me, he was, your father, in, in his own sort of way. Yeah. Sorry I couldn't get to the funeral, sir, but you know how it is. Yeah, we didn't miss much. But it flats in that plan. Everybody thinks, ah, you're creating a new Bond, a new Harry Palmer, a new Flint, all that kind of thing. Do you think we're doing anything? I think what we're doing, maybe subconsciously, is destroying all those images, actually. All right, then. 
Let's have it. What's been going on? Oh, I don't know, sir. He won't let me set eyes on Miss Catherine. Seven weeks now. Every time I ask, he says, well, she's sleeping. She's been sleeping for seven weeks. Well, that's what he says, sir. But what kind of sleep is that? Stuff like this all over the house. Yes. That's right, it's right. Yes, he's experimenting. He's in a terrible state himself, sir. Living off the stuff he is. All he eats now is bars of chocolate and strawberry jam. Well, that's no good for anyone, is it? Now listen. Is she still in her old room? Oh, yes, sir. Right. Then I'll be home tomorrow. Oh, that's good news, sir. But uh, you'll kick him out this time, won't you, sir? I'm afraid the old place is going up. Who say, sir? For keeps. Napalm, probably. Napalm, sir? Yeah. I haven't made up my mind yet. But you know what a traditionalist I am. Yes, indeed, sir. I think it's very entertaining, and I think it's what really people want to go and see. Um, I mean, we've read quite a lot of Moorcock's material. And of all the stories, this seemed to be the first one to try. And I think it's, in a way, breaking new ground in the kind of entertainment that uh, we want to put over to people. It doesn't fit into any category. It's an entertainment. It's got really everything in it. Sex, violence, action, adventure. I mean, it's everything. It would be wrong to categorize. I think what it tells is the uh, current collapse of Western civilization and uh, offers a solution, but in a, an underlying way. You know, it's really trying to entertain, not, not really to preach any, anything very strong. Ah! Oh. Shit, Greek! Ooh. Ow. Oh. Oh. You crazy bitch. You tried to kill me. Seemed like a good idea. It wasn't really your destiny, Dimitri. Hey, Miss Brunner. Where the hell are you going, for God's sake? So it's in. Is it? Now, Dimitri. But now, piss off! It's like going to the circus. That's what it really is. It's a, you never know quite what's going to happen. Every time you expect something, you're wrong-footed because something else happens. The hero never plays it quite the way you expect he's going to play it. But somehow, he gets carried along by the whole thing. The whole thing is a story, but nevertheless, it's kind of... Um, I, it, you know, when you talk about what the significance of the film is, that immediately puts it into a kind of... A heavier category. It's really like a lot of very important icing on an inconsequential cake. Neville, just two questions. First of all, how did the film turn out? Well, very disappointing actually because it, um, it's got the best opening I've seen in a film for a long time. The first reel is cracking, it's mysterious, it's gripping, it's ex exciting and then after that it sort of slightly loses impetus and just at the end sort of tails off. But the, the opening is, is a smashing. And the second question is, have they created another James Bond in cinema terms? Well, I don't know if they've created a James Bond. I mean, the, the Moorcock books, the, the figure, Jerry Cornelius, I think is terrific. It's a very, very good idea. Um, I certainly hope that they go on to make more of, of his books, more films of his books, because the idea is so good. But whether they've created a Bond or not, I, I don't know. <laughs> Neville, thanks very much. Thank you. And so now to the adventures of Barry McKenzie, that lumbering, chundering, drug-swilling, technicolour yawning, colonial boy at large in the wild hinterlands of Earl's Court and New South Kensington. Hey, Bazza, all your horses. It's Craig Thompson. I got two spare tickets to the Royal Garden Party at Buck House this Arvo. Can you use them? In the film, as in the strip cartoon, the Australians tend to be big, hearty, drunken innocents, while the English are represented as rapacious taxi drivers and landlords, seedy poofs and girls on the make. The movie stars Barry Crocker and was written by Barry Humphreys, and this is obviously going to be one of those programs where every Tom, Dick and Harry is called Barry. I do wish some of these people would change their names. Anyway, the plot takes Barry McKenzie through one strip cartoon adventure after another. In most of them, some frightful pom is trying to exploit him, while Barry is most interested in laying hot hands on the nearest available Sheila. Unfortunately, he never, to use his own phrase, manages to feature. Though in this scene, at the television centre of all places, is nothing sacred? He does flashes nasty in front of dear innocent Joan Bakewell. Hi, 
Well, do you agree with those cynics who say that English culture is going to the dogs? Oh, by that. Flaming dogs have left that many William the Thirds on the footpath that's a wonder more people don't slip and break their necks. It's brilliant. <laughs> Mr. Mackenzie, what do you feel about English girls? Pommy Sheilas. Oh, they're apples, I suppose. But to tell you the truth, the way I feel at the moment, and that pull that if a nice little potato peeler walked past flashing a lovely pair of fun bags, I ascertain it'd be a sad case of brewer's droop. I'm afraid I don't quite see your point. Me point? Well, cop this, then. Fade out the music. Go to one again. That's right. Keep the beat on it. Those are right in on it. I want the whole thing. <laughs> Where's the book channel? Oh, well, damn the director general. This is a television breakthrough. I want to get out of here. A clump. Go to one. Get him out of it. Go to one. Get me out of man. I'll try Batman to get us from out the other altogether. I don't, get him out I don't of know. Me. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Mackenzie, as a distinguished Australian intellectual. Go on. The Adventures of Barry Mackenzie is a sprawling and uneven picture in which some of the jokes take off wildly, while others drop like the proverbial lead balloon. But it contains enough invention, wit, and bizarre humour to make it, on the whole, eminently worth watching. One of the stars of the film is Edna Everidge, a sort of Antipodean Mary Whitehouse, who plays Barry Mackenzie's aunt. Barry, that was the last straw. Come on, you'll be the death of me, Barry. I'm sorry, Auntie. Don't sorry me. You just turn your back. I'm going to change into something more feminine. Uh, turn on the automatic sprinklers, you idiot. Can I sprinkle it, sir? What's up, my old lovely? Oh, Christ, leave us alone, will you, mate? I've just done something more than a bit on the embarrassing side. Fancy a bastard flashing the old mutton dagger and mixed company. But you don't understand. I've got the most fantastic news for you. You've been offered your own series. Series? Series fiddlesticks! I'll tell you what you're doing, young fellow, my lad. You're coming to Heathrow with me, and I'm taking you back to Sydney, where you belong. Well, now I'm delighted to announce that I have in the studio with me Edna Everidge herself. Mrs. Everidge, or Edna, if, I'm, if I may call you Edna, it must have been a most enormous thrill for you to find yourself transformed from, from housewife to superstar, overnight, as it were. Barry, may I call you there? Please, yes. Barry, here am I in London, an ordinary Australian housewife, and I make no bones about that. I may be, to you viewers, I may be a superstar, but I assure you that only recently I was up to my wrists in my kitchen sink in Melbourne, and here am I whisked into stardom. Sometimes as I wake up perhaps at an odd hour, and one does after a long flight, in my suite at the Royal Rillington Plaza Hotel in Ladbroke Grove, London, um, or Telegrams Christie, London, I... I have to pinch myself. Quite honestly, I do. I still can't believe all this wonderful, wonderful thing has happened to me. Because apart from uh, Elizabeth Taylor, you are the only housewife superstar, I think. It is quite true. In fact, I'm hoping I'll get a little telegram from Elizabeth Taylor on the opening night of The Adventures of Barry Mackenzie, my starring vehicle at the Columbia. But, uh, of course, Elizabeth Taylor has paid the penalty, as we see from the sad news about her marriage, However, of course, I was married to my husband, Norm, for many, many years before stardom. You don't, think it, will affect your, you don't think it will affect your, way, your marriage? No, I don't think so. I'm only sorry my husband, Norm, can't be here in London. He did want to, but he has not been a well person at all. I'm sad. What, what is, what's the problem? My husband has a double hernia, so he has his hands full at the moment. Yes, I, I can well understand that he might. Uh, uh, is this superstardom you now have, is this going to change your life at all? No, dear, I've had my change of life, or I imagine I have. Uh, it has, of course, been very warm and close in London, and I've been running around. We don't always know. We women are funny things. <laughs> yeah. But it's not a thing I'd like to talk about on television. Uh, no, I'm I didn't sorry. expect an in-depth interview, you know. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't really mean to bring the subject quite up quite right. like that. No, not at all. No. Uh, can we perhaps return to the film? How, how did you get the part? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at these gorgeous glands. Aren't they absolutely gorgeous? Beautiful. <laughs> Look at this one. It's a Concord gladi. Uh, Australian? <laughs> yes, gladdies are Australia's national flower. How did I get the part? Uh, well, I was playing the role of Mary Magdalene in a passion play at the mm. Holy Trinity Church, Mooney Ponds, which is a suburb of Melbourne, one of our dress circle suburbs. And Mr Brian Humphreys, the uh, actor or writer, what you will, spotted me and he was in the process of making a film called The Adventures of Barry Mackenzie, which is based on the life story of my Sydney nephew, Barry Mackenzie. And he wanted someone to play the role of Barry's auntie and who better than his real auntie. So one moment I'm Mary Magdalene <laughs> and the next moment here I am in London. I, I, I tell you, Barry, I can still hardly believe it. Well, it was inspired casting, of course. Of course. Uh, well, I enjoyed it and I've learned a lot about my craft as a filmic artist. I, you know, it's, it's a very technical thing. And I was happy, too, to have a son in my little son, Kenny, with a real interest in the art form of the film. My son, Kenny, in Melbourne. He can't be with us because he is a very busy little window dresser in Melbourne. But he is editor of the Melbourne Compassionate Camera. Um, and he's always been interested in films. He's a real little film buff. He's got the real qualification for being a film buff, too. Has he? No talent whatever. However, I'm glad he hasn't because he'd only mix with the wrong element. Be that as it may, he loves the films. He can quote absolutely word for word a lot of the wonderful old films. Betty Davis saying, help, help, I've killed him and I'm glad. You know that moment? Oh, indeed. And the yes. end of Gone with the Wind. Kenny's always quoting it. Play it again tomorrow, Sam, will you please? Or something of that, that sort. Kenny Almost would get exactly. it. Kenny would get it. I know some of them myself. Of course, I love the films too and I'm looking forward to my future in films. An opportunity, perhaps, dare I utter it, of playing opposite Stuart Granger or Michael Wilding or even Walter Pidgeon, but is that asking too much? And perhaps meeting some of my screen favourites, James Booth and Anne Ziegler, some of those folk. Ah, oh, with great old names, of It course. must be exciting in your job too, Barry. I'm talking all about myself. <coughs> Excuse no, please, me, a little bit of a frog. I'm talking all about myself and I don't know anything about you, but I'm sure there's a lot to know. Well, you must meet a lot of the celebrities here on this programme. None quite like yourself, Edna. Thank you very much very, indeed. Very, sweet of you to say so. And I've just thought of another little quote. And somehow it always makes me feel good when I think of it. Um, just a moment. Oh, I can hear Kenny saying it now. Yes. As Lauren Bacall said to Pinocchio, if you feel like a blow, rub your whistles together and always let your conscience be your guide. Well, on that very uh, appropriate quotation. Lovely, I'd, I'd thank you. Always... Something like that, anyway, love. Yes, very like that. Thank you very much indeed, Edna, and good luck. Thank you, for Barry. For your career as a superstar. I look forward to seeing you all at the Columbia for the adventures of Barry McKenzie, my starring vehicle. And on behalf of you, Barry, I'd like to thank you all for watching our program, those of you who still are. And I'd like to wish you all the very best that you'd wish yourselves. And on behalf of all the team here at ITV, May God bless you, everyone. Bye-bye. But, but where, where, where will I sit and what will I do? You just do what is obvious and sit where Mr. Northbrook tells you. You see your brother there. I know, you need an order. Lottie, go and fetch the ambassador, will you? My dear. Hello. My dear, such fun of you in love. We are taking Miss Marina to the Abbey. Oh, are we? But I need an order for her, my dear. Oh, dear ambassador, fetch me that nice move order. The one the regent gave to the foreign secretary the other day. My dear mother-in-law! What is that one you were wearing, Lottie? The purple pillow? No, that would hardly suit. The move one is much more fetching. So slim and pretty. We will now be most comfortable in the carriage. Hand it to the regent. 
you realize, I suppose, that this order is only given for a very special personal service to the head of the state? Oh, such hair splitting. No doubt she will do you one one day. Take your cape off. Kneel down. I hereby invest you with the Royal Carpathian Order of Perseverance. Second class. Come, my dear. And I hereby return you this. After all, we're not parting quite yet, are we, my darling Grand Duke? Good evening. Marilyn Monroe, actress, sexpot, victim, predator and all-round heroine of folk legend and myth, will be returning to the tragic and pathetic Marilyn in a few minutes. Meantime, you will, of course, have recognised her co-star in that scene from The Prince and the Showgirl, Laurence Olivier, for my money the greatest actor and certainly the greatest stage actor in the world. In the cinema, he'll be remembered most of all for his Shakespearean films, Henry V, Hamlet, for which he won an Oscar, Richard III, and most recently, Othello, a filmed record of his triumphant performance at the National Theatre. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? <laughs> I gave her such a one. It was my first gift. I know not that, but such a handkerchief, I'm sure it was your wife's. Did I today see Cassio wipe his beard with? If it be that or any that was hers, he speaks against her with the other proof. <laughs> that the slave had 40,000 lives! One is too poor, too weak for my revenge! Now do I see, it is true. Look, here, your go. All my fond love, thus do I blow to heaven. It is gone. Olivier as Othello, Frank Finlay as Honest Iago. This week a very different version of Othello opens in London, a rock musical version called Catch My Soul, the title being taken from Othello's line to Desdemona, Perdition, Catch My Soul, But I Do Love Thee. Any girl who failed to respond to a line like that would have to be made of ice. Not that anybody says anything so romantic in this version, Catch My Soul doesn't present us with great generals, Venetian courtiers and noble ladies. The fellow here is a poverty-stricken evangelist in New Mexico, and Desdemona, his middle-class wife, and about 12 years old by the look of her. Anything that happens to them is quite simply not the stuff of tragedy. By reducing the status of the characters, the film also reduces the events in which they're involved to the level of a rather sordid melodrama inspired by unreasonable jealousy. This wouldn't have mattered too much if the movie had retained the outrageous zest and dark humour of the stage musical which Catch My Soul originally was. But due to Jack Good's brooding script and Patrick McGowan's slow-paced direction, zestful and humorous is what it ain't. Nor is it very subtle. Othello is no longer the great man brought low, and Iago is unrecognisable as that most complex of all villains. The music doesn't lift things much either. However, let's see Iago, played by Lance Legault, goading Richie Havens as Othello down in New Mexico. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? I gave her such a one. It was my first gift. I know not that. But such a handkerchief, I'm sure it was your wife's. Did I today see Cassio wipe his mouth with? If it be that. If it be that or any that was hers, it speaks against her with the other proofs. Lend me your handkerchief. Here, my lord. That which I gave you. I have it not about me. Not? No, indeed, my lord. Wherefore? 
Is it gone? Is it lost? Speak! It's not lost. But what if it were? Gretchen, I want to see it. I'll lose this napkin. Uh, 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 under Cassidy's roof. Uh, uh, uh. Then I'll let him find it. That'll be my proof. Uh, trifles light and airy can seem unto a jealous man. A handkerchief! Confirmations strong as gospel truth. Yes, they can. Dom, 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 dom. Mm. In America, Alexandro Jodorowsky's film El Topo has become something of a cult, and it's certainly one of the most remarkable movies we're likely to see this year. It's been called a drug trip and an exercise in mystical violence. It's also been called a masterpiece, a religious allegory, and a parable of good and evil. And it might even be all of those things. Whatever else it is, it's a spectacular achievement by Jodorowsky, who stars in it, wrote and directed it, and composed the music for it. Jodorowsky plays El Topo, the mole, and to begin with, he looks like Clint Eastwood in a spaghetti western, except that he has his small son riding naked with him. Like Eastwood, he's an avenger, hunting down and killing the bandits who've slaughtered a whole town. Then, things do become rather obscure. He abandons his son, takes up with the girl, and rides off into the desert, where he performs small miracles, finding food and water where none existed before. He also seeks out challenges and kills four masters, each representing a different religion. After which, he repents his sins, and is therefore shot, very symbolically, in the hands and feet, by a lesbian who makes off with his girl. Well, next, our hero turns up as a holy man in a colony of cripples, who live in a cave from which they're unable to escape which is where the mole comes in, because El Topo helps them to burrow out and join a nearby township with cataclysmic results. Actually, I'm reluctant to tell you all this because the film works on the emotions rather than the intellect and is thus both inexplicable and indescribable. But it looks marvellous and is absolutely riveting. Here now is the moment when El Topo abandons his gun and acquires his stigmata. Dios mío, Dios mío, ¿por qué me has desamparado? ¿Por qué estás tan lejos de mi salvación y de las palabras de mi clamor? Dios mío, clamo de día y no respondes, y de noche y no hay reposo. O él o yo.
muéstrame tus caminos y enséñame tus sendas. Encamíname en tu verdad y enséñame, porque tú eres el Dios de mi salvación. Make what you will of all that. The Macintosh Man is a suspense thriller without much suspense and not all that many thrills either. It's okay, it's undemanding and reasonably entertaining, and it has Paul Newman putting on an Australian accent that would cause Barry McKenzie to have a technicolour yawn. Newman plays a British agent who gets himself jailed for robbery in order to make contact with the Scarferers, a gang that helps high security prisoners to escape. Hi. So Newman escapes along with a Russian agent called Slade, whose resemblance to George Blake is by no means coincidental. The plot is full of agents and double agents, double crosses and triple crosses, and smooth politicians who are not all they seem. More interestingly, perhaps, the cast is full of people like Harry Andrews, Ian Bannon, Robert Lang, and even James Mason, whose roles are so comparatively brief that one can only hope they were paid for the time spent making the film rather than the time spent appearing in it. Can it perhaps have started life as a rather longer picture and been chopped a bit? I shouldn't be at all surprised. Anyway, as I said, it works adequately enough as a thriller, but it's mildly disconcerting to find that it was made by John Houston, a director who's not always consistent, but who at his best, as in The Maltese Falcon or The Asphalt Jungle, leaves his fingerprints all over his work. The Macintosh Man, by contrast, seems to have been made by a director wearing gloves. Anyway, let's have a look at Paul Newman having escaped from prison, escaping in turn from the Scarperers. Now let's see how good they really are. When I reported from the Cannes Film Festival in May, I said that one of the delights to come was certainly Francois Truffaut's Day for Night. Well, at last it's going to open in London next week. And as an example of witty and stylish filmmaking, I can't recommend it too highly. Basically, it's a film about a film director, played by Truffaut himself, making a film, which may sound cannibalistic, if not downright incestuous. But it's beautifully and affectionately observed, the characters are marvellously defined, and it'll teach you more about the business of filmmaking than any number of earnest documentaries. Above all, it has an enchanting performance by Valentina Corteza, as an actress who's slightly over the hill and slightly drunk and can't quite remember her lines. Jacqueline Bissett plays the up-and-coming young star, and here she is, being directed by Truffaut.
Julie. Oui. Tenez, venez, je vais vous expliquer. Vous voyez, on a fait ce décor pour suggérer que vous habitez là, avec Alphonse, en face de la villa des parents. Bon, je crois qu'on va pouvoir y aller maintenant. Prenez la 44 première. Bon, je donnerai la réplique, puisqu'Alphonse n'est pas là. Ah, Alphonse, toujours amoureux, toujours des salades. Ça, c'est bien vrai. D'ailleurs, un de ces jours, je ferai un film qui s'appellera Les salades de l'amour. <rire> Allons-y, Julie. Hello, les enfants Alors, Alphonse Pamela Dépêchez-vous Bonjour, ma belle Bonjour Venez avec nous avant d'aller choisir les déguisements. Alphonse est encore au lit. La phrase, Julie, la phrase. Tes parents nous invitent. Oui, d'accord. C'est d'accord, nous arrivons. Bon. Pas mal, coupé, on recommence. Allons-y, Julie. Bonjour, ma Bonjour. Les le petit déjeuner avec nous avant d'aller choisir les déguisements. Alphonse est encore dormi. Pas dormi, au lit. Tes parents nous invitent. Incidentally, Truffaut and his films will be the subject of Omnibus on December the 2nd. Now, listen to this. So we think of Marilyn, who was every man's love affair with America. Marilyn Monroe, who was blonde and beautiful and had a sweet little rinky-dink of a voice and all the cleanliness of all the clean American backyards. She was our angel, the sweet angel of sex, and the sugar of sex came up from her like a resonance of sound in the clearest grain of a violin. Norman Mailer at his most purple in what he calls his novel biography of Marilyn Monroe, the girl from the orphanage who trudged doggedly up the road to stardom, pausing occasionally at a wayside casting couch to get her bearings. Mailer's book is more like a love letter to the late lamented goddess, almost an act of necrophilia. He describes her obvious charms with salivating relish and hates the men she married, Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller, with the passion of an unsuccessful rival. What he tells us about Marilyn Monroe is not at all new. Indeed, he cribbed nearly all of it from other biographies. But what he tries to do, that's different from the other biographies, is to analyse and explain this paradoxical creature who was screwed by the movie industry and who herself screwed nearly all the people who helped her. Marilyn, says Mailer, was a movie star of the most stubborn secretiveness and flamboyant candour, a queen of a castrator who was ready to weep for a dying minnow. Beneath the little girl voice and the baby blue eyes, she was as tough as a hobnailed boot and able to inspire the most violent hatred. Tony Curtis said that kissing her was like kissing Hitler, and after directing her in Some Like It Hot, Billy Wilder said it was weeks before he could look at his wife without wanting to hit her simply because she was a woman. Marilyn was a marriage wrecker, other people's as well as her own, and the inspiration for more masturbatory fantasies than Freud ever dreamed of. She had affairs, and Mailer mentions them all, with Brando and Sinatra and Yves Montand, and possibly Bobby Kennedy. And her death from an overdose of drugs in 1962 may have been an accident, suicide, or even, he says, murder. He also suggests, titillatingly, that somebody very important indeed may have been sleeping with her the night she died. It's a glossy, overwritten book, immensely readable, and lavishly illustrated with some splendid photographs. But in the end, Mailer fails. He doesn't explain Monroe, he merely expands the legend. But then nearly everyone who writes or talks about her does that, as Film 73 discovered when last year, the 10th anniversary of her death, we interviewed some of the people who knew her, people like screenwriter George Axelrod and film director Joshua Logan. By the time Marilyn was ready to come back to Hollywood, we had, by that time, perfected, in our opinion, a vehicle for her in which she could really shine, in that she could uh, do everything that she could do that was sexy and wonderful and delicious and exciting and tender and dirty and all the great things she could do, and still be just outside that pasteboard character that 20th had invented for her. The moment the film is running in the camera, Marilyn acts. You cannot get her to stop it. Even if she would forget a line, which occasionally she did, not because she didn't know it, but because she was so critical of herself that, that she would hate the way she'd read the last line and begin think about, thinking about that instead of reading the line that was supposed to be said. Difficulty in lines would be an understatement for Miss Monroe. Miss Monroe simply could not memorize anything. She could not memorize, when she lived on Lexington Avenue, which she did in New York, she could not, not memorize Lexington Avenue. 
Joe Curtis, my assistant, uh, would read her the line. We coached him to, to throw the line at her. She kept acting all through the coaching so that you, you didn't feel that she was listening to a prompt. Joe Curtis's voice says, I've always wanted love. He talks like a dialogue director. Marilyn says, I've always dreamed. Joe, what the f was you? Cut. <laughs> but nobody dare say cut. So he just says, go on, darling, go on. She, it was really quite romantic. There's several pauses like that in Bus Stop if you look carefully. I don't know why I keep expecting myself to fall in love, but I do. Well, I know I expect to someday. I'm seriously beginning to wonder if there's a kind of love I have in mind. What's that? I don't know. I. Well, you see, I've been going with guys since I was about 12. Honest? Honey, I almost made a cousin of mine when I was 14. But I... Pappy wouldn't have it. I never heard of anyone married so young. Down the Ozarks, we don't waste much time. <sighs> I sure am glad, though, I never married my cousin Malcolm. Because he turned out real bad. Just like Pappy predicted. But I sure was crazy about him at the time. And I've been losing my head about some guy ever since. Bo was the first one that ever wanted to marry me. Since my cousin Malcolm, naturally, I'd like to get married and have a family and all them things. But you've never been in love? I don't know. Maybe I have and I didn't know it. That's what I mean. Maybe I don't know what love is. Yeah. Poor Marilyn. Well, to continue the nostalgic note, let's have a look at another book, 50 Years of Movie Posters, compiled by John Cabal. In a way, it charts the history of the movie industry through its advertising posters, which range like the films they hustled from the artistic to the downright vulgar, and as David Robinson says in his introduction, mirror the soul of Hollywood itself. The style of the posters changed slowly but subtly through the years, but always, to quote Robinson again, using the human form as a provocation and the letters of the alphabet as a violence. Compare these early efforts for a Chaplin film that, in the end, was probably never made, and for Theda Bara in The Forbidden Path, the blood-curdling story of a beautiful model who became a vampire. That was in the 1920s. By the 30s, things hadn't changed too much, although the poster for Raoul Walsh's A Ticket to Hell may have become a little more sophisticated. In the 1940s, this was how they advertised Edward G. Robinson in Brother Orchid. And by the 1950s, movie promotion and general advertising were all mixed up together, as in this somewhat Freudian linking of Rita Hayworth and sparking plugs. We'll be back next week on Wednesday night. Until then, I'll leave you with a montage of great movie posters. Not great movies, perhaps, but great posters. Good night. <laughs>
I think all actors uh, wake up one morning and say, this is a very strange way of earning a living, and uh, perhaps not very noble and perhaps not very important. But uh, I disagree with that. I think that, uh, as somebody said in the 18th century, we're happy children who, if we don't do any appreciable good, we do no appreciable harm. And in a world where people are doing a lot of appreciable harm, it is something to be harmless. Peter Finch, an actor who certainly appears to have done nobody any harm. On the contrary, he's provided a great many people with a great deal of pleasure. One remembers films like Simon and Laura, A Town Like Alice, The Shirley, The Girl with Green Eyes and The Pumpkin Eater. This year, as he comes up for his 58th birthday, still looking quite disgracefully young, Peter Finch may well be at the peak of his career. A year ago, he starred in Ross Hunter's musical remake of Lost Horizon, a disappointing film, but one which nevertheless probably did even more to establish him on the international market than Bloody Sunday, for which he was nominated for an Oscar. Next year, Mr. Finch will be seen co-starring with Leif Ullman in The Abdication, another big movie aimed at an international audience and directed by Britain's Anthony Harvey. The film was made on location in Scandinavia, in Rome, and in Caserta, near Naples. It was there that I spoke to Peter Finch about his career. Peter, you've been uh, masquerading as an Australian for a long time. Whereabouts in Australia were you born? I was born in uh, Cromwell Road, South Kensington. That's what I thought. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I haven't masqueraded as an Australian, but the Australians claim me as an Australian, and I was actually born in England. And uh, I haven't bothered to refute it. I don't see why one shouldn't be claimed by Australia if they want it. No, indeed not. But you, before you went to Australia, you were going to be a Buddhist priest, is this right? Yes, I was, uh, I was with my grandmother in France, in, in Vaucresson near Paris, and she was a theosophist and, and embraced the Buddhist faith. Now we went to Madras in India uh, for a Theosophical Congress and where incidentally I met Gandhi when I was a very small child and uh, she gave me to a Buddhist monk, I suppose it's a sort of an acolyte, and I was carted off to Madras and I lived in a room with this chap for about ten days I think and I had my hair shaved off and the saffron robe. Uh, didn't know what he was talking about, he didn't know what I was talking about, and then eventually um, the British Raj got to hear of it and uh, police, I can vaguely remember policemen and army officers and coming to get me and giving me back to my grandmother. And shortly after that I left for Australia. I was about 10 or 11 at the time. But you left, you left school quite early, didn't you, at about 14? Yes. Well, uh, Was that during the Depression? Yes. Perforce we all came out of school and there were no jobs and, and I didn't finish. Uh, we couldn't, I couldn't afford, and my cousins that I was living with couldn't afford to let me finish school, so I didn't pass my intermediate exam. And uh, I went to, to work in a variety of jobs, first of all in a newspaper, Sydney Sun. Uh, Were you any good as a journalist? No, I was terrible. I, I was uh, a copy boy, really, at first, and then, and then a cadet reporter. Uh, and, and I, I don't see how you can be any good as a journalist when you have to do the dreary jobs that a cadet has to do. I had to do wool sales. That's, you know, um, just accounting how much the wool sales were and shipping. Mm. And they gave you all the dreariest jobs. And then eventually I did have an interesting job and I was, I was a sort of uh, assistant to a man at Supreme Court. So I saw a lot of those, a lot of cases. And, things. and I was sacked for uh, general inefficiency and and no, I was lazy and didn't really like it. Well, how, how did you get to be an actor from that kind of background? Well, uh, amongst many other jobs, when I lost the job on the, on the newspaper, I did uh, a variety of jobs. I worked on a cattle station and, and jumped the rattler, which is uh, jumping trains. Mm -hmm. And there was a hobo, and chopped wood and anything. I got, you know, so many jobs I can't remember. And then one period back in Sydney, uh, I was at the uh, Salvation Army Dosh House. I really was very at the bottom of the barrel. And uh, there was an advertisement in one of the papers that said that, the, that a vaudeville company needed a straight man. And uh, 
I'd done a little bit of sort of acting at school. And one of these characters suggested that I'd be a good straight man because he said, you've got a toffee voice, <laughs> which meant the English accent. And uh, I went down, and much to my surprise, I got this job, feeding the comedian. And also, one had to do everything in vaudeville. <clears throat> and I was also uh, in the chorus. And I had learned a few steps, and I had to hoof. And I, re I remember now uh, the, the, the bitterness of it all, but in the height of the Depression, uh, the opening chorus of, of the vaudeville show, and we were all dressed in frayed pink dinner suits. And uh, th there were about four or five poor devils in the audience with their coat collars turned up. And uh, the opening chorus was, uh, we're in the money, come on, honey. Oh. And uh, there was sadness. All the Depression songs were enormously sad. Mm -hmm. you know, every clown has a silver lining. They were all symptomatic of the Depression. And I always remember these days singing these terribly sad, hopeful songs. And I drifted from vaudeville into radio and gradually into the theatre and then finally into the cinema. Yes, because, it, I mean, as far as Britain was concerned, you were discovered by the... Olivier's, weren't you, when you had your own company, yeah. the Mercury Theatre? Well, that was much later than, than this vaudeville period. Mm. I, I'd done radio, and I, uh, most uh, Sydney actors lived on radio. I mean, that was the bread. And uh, <clears throat> then, uh, after the war, I formed uh, a company, and uh, we couldn't get premises. It's very difficult in Sydney to get a theatre. And we decided to do what the English had done during the war, which is to go around playing factories, and we built a Meccano set of a proscenium arch, and we carried our own switchboard, and we, 14 of us, and we had a truck, and we worked what was called, they were, they were great days, so we worked what was called Commonwealth. In other words, uh, everybody got the same salary, mm -hmm. and uh, if there was any profits, we plowed them back into the next show. And uh, we did Moliere and Schnitzler and things like that. It was a wonderful opportunity for me to play in some classics that I hadn't. And uh, I was at a glass blowing factory, uh, playing lunchtime Molière, and the uh, Olivias who were touring with the old Vic decided to come and see it. I, I remember I was so nervous that I was playing the Malade Imaginaire that the, the, the other actors swore that before the curtain went up, I took some of the phony pills that were in a, in, in a, in a bottle. And um, <clears throat> after the show, they came around and they were enormously impressed with it with the acting and the whole company. But I think mostly with our courage, and, and Larry said, you know, this is the real theater, this is the, these are the street corner actors, and this is what really our business is about, is going out and playing things and building everything yourself. And, and he offered me a, a sort of chance in England, he said, when you come to England, come and see me. And then my theater, the Mercury, collapsed for ones of finance. We couldn't get enough factory. Mm -hmm. And I came to England, didn't get a job with him immediately because he had a play in mind but didn't want to tell me in case I was disappointed. And I got a, my first job in England was at Ealing Studios um, in a, a film called Train of Events with Basil Beard. Oh, yes. And that is where I first met your father who was working there in, in the great days of Ealing.
then after that, while I was making the film, uh, Larry Olivia rang, rang me up and said, I've got a play, I'd like you to audition for it. And uh, it was Daphne Loriola by Bridie. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Edith Evans and Felix Elmer, fantastic cast. It was, it was the luckiest break any actor could have had. And uh, fortunately for me, it was a great success. Has there been a great element of luck in, in your career? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, actors say that it's 50% talent and 50% luck. And I think that I've had a very good percentage of luck. Uh, one, number one, the... the uh, the Olivia's telling me to come to England when I did. I think I would have come anyway, but it was good timing. Uh, then the play, Daphne Loriola, which I did, which is an enormous success. It could have been a flop, and that wouldn't have helped. And then uh, in films, I think I had lucky timing too. Um, so, I, you know, luck has followed me, fortunately. But you've, you've never allowed yourself to be typecast in films, have you? Has this stopped you, do you think, from becoming a sort of John Wayne type superstar? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, I think that, uh, that the public, uh, film going public, really like their, their stars to be, to take John Wayne or Jimmy Stewart or, or any, of the, any of the great male stars of that era. And there was, there was a predictability about their performances and, and wonderful performances they were. But uh, I, I think that they like to know who you are, what you are, and they're a little confused, perhaps, a vast public, if you uh, choose to play a variety of parts. Um, Was there any attempt ever made to, to push you into certain types of roles? Uh, yes, I, I successfully avoided the naval hat. I, I never got in near the naval hat. Uh, poor Johnny Mills did. You know, there was one period when Johnny Mills was uh, was a naval officer, movie after movie, and he finally escaped from that. Uh, I would, I was, I had a dangerous period when I started to play sort of jungle gym parts. Oh yes. After after uh, the Nun story, which was a big success for me, it was a very successful movie. And uh, after that, I played um, another doctor in the jungle. Um, and a, and a district administrator in the jungle, and another one in the jungle, and then suddenly I thought I've got to get away from this, otherwise I'll finish up forever in, in khaki shorts and <laughs> running around the jungle. What's that building? Well, that's my factory where we process the tea. Are we on your plantation now? Our plantation, darling. We've been on it for about half an hour. Half an hour? That's miles. Yes, it is a few. <laughs> That's that lop-eared old bull again. Oh, I'll take a picture oh, of him. Stay where you are. Oh, is he dangerous? Be quiet, Ruth. <laughs> Give him a noise he understands. I'm certainly glad he did understand. John? That... I, I think it was the first time that I got known in Hollywood and amongst the American companies. It wasn't a very successful film, but the one that really launched me with American companies was The Nun Story, yeah. which was a huge success and a wonderful picture too, I think, you know. Uh, and, and from then on, I've done a lot of American films, I think mostly because of The Nun Story. You'll say six Arby's and a paternoster for that bit of vanity, sister. I'm Dr. Fortunati. You must be the new sister. Yes, I'm Sister Luke. How do you do? How do you do? Well, the drums were right. I see somebody told you what they said. I believe I'm to assist you in the operating room, Doctor. Yes? I hope you bear up longer than the last sister. I can only try. 
These summer months, this room gets like a bake oven by nine in the morning, so I operate at five. That means you get up at four. I'll be here. Sometimes I operate right through the time of your mass. So you'll get used to taking communion at that door there on those occasions. I'll have to ask permission of Reverend Mother. Reverend Mother's not in charge here. This is a government hospital. Still, I'll... But you're paid by the government, and therefore you're responsible to them. They don't pay you to pray, but it's just me. I understand that. It's all right. The Reverend Mother's given permission to the operating sisters. I can't have my nurses running off to mass in the middle of an operation. Five in the morning, eh? Have you ever assisted at an operation before? Yes. My father's Dr. Hubert von der Mull. Oh, she. You'll say another five hours and beg your soup for that little display of pride, sister. Which of the films you have done do you remember with, with most pride? I think uh, Oscar Wilde, Bloody Sunday, uh, and I expect the nun story. What particularly about those films? Was it because they, they were successful films, obviously, but they had particular challenge for you inherent in them? Um, no, I think that um, because uh, they, yeah, there was a challenge. Mm. I mean, for instance, when I played Oscar Wilde, everybody laughed and said I was the wrong shape and the wrong kind of actor. And it was a great challenge, and I think I succeeded. Uh, the Nun story, because of working with Freddie Zinnemann, I think it was the first time that I'd worked with a, a director of his mm -hmm. caliber and also with Audrey Hepburn. Um, and Bloody Sunday, again a difficult part and a challenge. And, and because of uh, Schlesinger's a really wonderful direction. Now, come on, let's have a listen. What's the matter? Oh, shit, I might as well tell you. I had a vaccination for smallpox yesterday. Why the hell didn't you come to me? I just thought... Oh, I don't know. It means you are going to America. I think so. But it wouldn't be for long. I always knew Italy was a fiction. Oh, don't. We'll go when I get back. Pointless. I want to go. Pointless. Would you like a drink? No. Thanks. You've won four British Film Academy Awards over, what, from 1958 to 1971? That's right. That's yeah. quite a remarkable record. Yeah, I'm very proud of that, actually. Because um, nobody else has won four. No, I think three, but I'm, I'm, I'm the only one with four. We got it for um, Town Like Alice, Oscar Wilde, Bloody Sunday. I've forgotten the other one. <laughs> uh, no Love for Johnny, No Love course. for Johnny, that's right. Because yeah. you won it two years in, in, in a row, right, in fact, yeah, with yes, um, yes, yes. Oscar Wilde and No I Love I was very Johnny. thrilled, you know, last time when I got up for Bloody Sunday and, and they said... Uh, He's the only one who's won it four times. And I said, does anybody want to play poker? I think I've got a good hand here. <laughs> there was one part you took which, which seemed an odd choice, and that was in Lost Horizon. Mm -hmm. why, why did you do that? Well, I think because uh, perhaps I was playing in, in, in things that were a little esoteric. I look, one looked back around about that period, and uh, uh, certainly The Pumpkin Eater and Bloody Sunday and, and films of which I'm enormously proud, of taking those two as an example, uh, are not the sort of films really that go in the vast. They're called art house pictures in America, and they're, they're not. They don't go in the vast areas. Uh, and I felt, and I liked the yarn. I think that Lost Horizon is a wonderful yarn. Also, wanted to make a musical. Uh, one always tries to stretch oneself somewhere else. And uh, you know, this, I thought this would reach a vaster audience, which indeed it has. It's it's it. I mean, in the places like Idaho and Albuquerque and all those places, <clears throat> it's a very popular movie. Just a minute. Yes, Mr. Conway? I'm in a quandary, and uh, I thought that you might be able to help me. I noticed you were having your course in elementary chang. What is your problem? 
Well, Chang tells me that as soon as I meet a woman I like, I must be prepared to give her up if somebody else likes her as well, and I don't think I'm capable of doing that. When that happens... I think it has. When that happens, the important thing is to try and make the other fellow the one who must be courteous. I see. I hadn't thought of it like that. Perhaps you could help me with some other questions. I have so many, I hardly know where to begin. You want to know who I am and what I'm doing here. My name is Catherine, and I was born here. Who are you? Well, almost born here. It was just beyond the pass. My parents were explorers who couldn't rest until they'd seen everything. Unfortunately, they died just on the other side. And Chang rescued you? Faithful Chang. He and his men found me, barely alive. Here I've grown up, and here I've been happy. With no desire to leave? Absolutely none. So I should know a good thing when I see it. Is that it? That's it. Good night, Mr. Conway. Uh, Peter, you had a reputation at one time for being a, a hellraiser. You and Trevor Howard and, and Errol Flynn. I'm sure you must have talked about this many times. But was it, in fact, a deserved reputation? I don't think so, I, except if you, you know, unless uh, hell raising means that you like a few jars. Uh, um, we got drunk and cut up a dark alley now and again. Um, I worked with there. I th actually, in, in fact, the, the hell raisers club, which was supposed to be, we were never, in fact, the three of us together at the one time. I did make a picture with Errol. Uh, that must have been an interesting experience. It was. It was one of his last pictures, and it was um, called The Dark Avenger. Supposedly about Richard Coeur de Leon. And uh, Errol played Richard Coeur de Leon. I was the villain in it. And I remember with, uh, with great joy and happiness uh, an episode in that when Errol was uh, asked to work on a Sunday. And he said, I never work on a Sunday because I'm a religious man. <laughs> and uh, he uh, uh, turned up, but uh, they said, you got to because we were behind schedule. So he arrived stoned out of his head. And, and uh, he was in armour and rode into the MGM courtyard and I was up on the battlements and he was supposed to uh, challenge me to a joust. Who goes there? Turn your mouth to the Black Knight wishes to speak to him. We'd had a lot of trouble on this picture with the visors because uh, when you were riding, uh, if the visors were too tight and, and you came to a stop in front of the camera and you had to push them up, uh, you couldn't get them up. And, and if they were too loose, they wobbled about as you were riding. So the props were always fixing the nut at the side of the visor. And they must have been fiddling with arrows anyway. So he rode into the courtyard, stared up at me, uh, completely out of his head. And uh, the director said, all right, Errol, start the jokes. Nothing happened at all. And so after three or four requests for him to start the scene, this completely blank face was staring up at us, incapable of any kind of speech. And very slowly, the visor came down over his face. And a voice inside the helmet said, Well, good night, all. <laughs> and he fell off the horse and was carried back to the Dorchester in full armor because he's a big man. They couldn't get him out of it. And he was smuggled in through the uh, uh, servant's entrance of the Dorchester. Uh, he was a very pleasant, wonderful man, and I'm very glad that I had that experience, you know. Who calls himself the Black Knight? What is your name? I've made a vow, my lord, never to reveal my name until the enemies of France have been defeated. A noble vow, if true. And what do you want with me? I wish to join forces with you, my lord. I hear you pay well for the services of good fighting men. <laughs> and you consider yourself one of the best? Certainly better than that fat knight who stands beside you. Our uh, wealth and fame and popular acclaim, are these important things to you, important rewards of acting? No, I, I mean, the silliest word in the world is success, because it, what does it mean, and, and, and what are the degrees of it? I think the only reason that one wants to be well-known and successful in, in this business is that it gives you choice. Mm. Uh, if you're a less successful actor, you have to take certain things uh, to eat, bread, looking after your family and your dependents, etc. When you are a little bit more successful, uh, it gives you an opportunity to choose, and that's really the only thing it means to me. Uh, 
money, one gets a little bit more money, which is useful. Uh, again, for the dependents. I've got so many dependents that uh, it, it, it's an, I am on a treadmill. I have to keep <laughs> working. But, you know, I've got two ex-wives and a few governments and a few children to pay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's nice, but that isn't really what one does it mm. for. Nor does it one do it to, for, for paparazzi to follow you down the street or that kind of fame. But, but it does give you the choice. I mean, I'm at a lucky stage now where, for instance, I've been offered an American special of, of any play of my choice, uh, which that is, is a, wonderful, a wonderful thing to happen, yes. you know, and I can choose the play. Whereas a few years ago, perhaps one you, could, you, you might have been offered a play, but you couldn't choose it. Yes. And that's a nice position to be in. You were saying just now that you've got two ex-wives to support and you're just mm. about, congratulations, mm -hmm. to get married again. Mm. Um, Sounds I'm... foolish, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I mean, Alita and I have been together for quite a long time now and uh, we seem to get on and I think that the piece of paper makes it a little bit more... I live a great gypsy existence and as we've got a baby daughter, um, it just makes it a little tidier when one's going around living in hotels and things. Didn't uh, Alita went recently to an Anglican minister in Rome, didn't she, to talk about getting married? Yes, yes. And he, what happened? Well, he, he was very pleasant and uh, did, didn't know any of our circumstances and didn't know us or that we'd lived together or that we... And he sat us down and he gave us a traditional talk about marriage and uh, hoped that we were serious about it and the purpose of it would be to have children. And it was a little ironical seeing that our two children were downstairs waiting. I didn't have the courage to take them upstairs. <laughs> and I sat straight faced through this lecture and said, thank you very much. And then he said, have either of you been divorced? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, we well, can't do that sort of thing. You better try the Methodists. It's a difficult life because it's a gypsy life. I mean, for instance, in the last two years, I haven't stopped traveling ever. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and I believe that you have to take your family with you everywhere, like a circus family. Uh, if you don't, I think there is the danger of just simply growing apart. And with an actor and an actress married, one working in the theatre at night and the other one working in a film in the daytime, you never see each other. And, and, and yeah. Those kind of stresses must be dangerous. Uh, also, perhaps when one's younger, you know one, one, one is playing with the beautiful people. Uh, perhaps the dangers of, of becoming enamoured on a film with somebody you're working with are also greater than in normal life. I hope you surmounted those dangers. Mm, well, I'm not answering that one, really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some of the dangers. <laughs> how, do you, how do you see the, the future for yourself? Well, I hope lots of work. I want to do this television, and I'd like to go back to the theatre. I'd love very much to play on Broadway, because I guess I'm a masochist. And all actors also are masochists in some curious way. They flirt with failure. And I'd like to play on Broadway because I've never done it. And also, you know, that you either are a great success mm. and everybody's wonderful to you, or you sit in sardis and somebody comes in with the notices and you close the next night and nobody speaks to you. Because in America, a failure is a, is a disease. And if you're a failure, uh, people will not touch you. They won't even walk on the same side of the street as you. And I'd like to uh, chance my arm at either this wonderful feeling of success or get the hell out of town as quickly as possible. <laughs>